Good afternoon, I'm Rod Howe. I'm the executive director here at the History Center. I know it's a beautiful day outside, so I appreciate those of you who chose to spend the, day, the afternoon in here. Uh, we, I love the poster. It says, we are a community of makers. How many of you think that we are a community of makers? Okay, good. Um, my guess is that many of you already know about the Ithaca Generation, Generator uh, Initiative um, or the Makerspace Initiative more broadly. Good, I'm glad some of you don't. So you'll learn something this afternoon. Uh, we really appreciate Elliot Wells uh, working with us uh, on this program uh, from Ithaca Generator. Uh, it seemed to fit in with our exhibit. This is the last day of our Made in Tompkins County exhibit. Uh, and so you'll see a timeline of businesses and industries on the wall. Uh, many of th these, these represent makers in our community. But we want to make sure that we continue to be a community of makers. Um, you can see that you're going to get to play with some blocks uh, later on in the day. Uh, so we're excited about that. Um, someone dropped off a, a little program that's on the table over here about a STEM event for girls in grades six through nine, which will be on Saturday, April 1st at Tompkins Cortland Community College. So if you want more information about this, uh, there's some flyers over on the table. I'm turning it over to Elliot and he'll take us through the rest of the program. Thanks, Elliot. Hello. Um, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you very much uh, for your introduction and for having us today. Um, it's great to work with um, organizations uh, in the community and discover the um, areas of overlap between our missions. Uh, I wouldn't have thought that we'd be at a, um, a history center necessarily uh, today when I got uh, involved with the generator, but um, with Maiden Tompkins County being the, uh, the theme, um, it seemed like a great fit and I'm very grateful that we had a chance to connect. So in a minute I'm going to welcome up uh, our panelists, but I would like to start by turning off my cell phone and encouraging others to do the same. Uh, much like a movie theater. Um, but first I want to introduce a, a very special um, young entrepreneur and maker in our community. Um, Isaac Lee Kaltman is here and he uh, does sales and product testing for Ithaca Toys, which is a business which has sprung out of Ithaca Generator, which you'll hear more about. And um, he's here to tell us a little bit about some of the things that um, that him and his family are making right here in Tompkins County. Hey, Isaac, do you want to tell us what you're working on? Right now, I've been working on um, a Christmas tree. I just made part of the Christmas tree. I made maybe the bottom. I'm going to flip it over soon. And it's a domino effect part. So once I push one part, it's going to go flat and look just like a Christmas tree. Wow. And and what are, what are these blocks that you're, you're playing with? What's special about them? You can do whatever you want. Like right here, my dad made a puzzle. Right out of these blocks. I'm gonna try to pick it up and put it so you guys can see it. It's gonna be a bit hard. Stopping. Back. Well, that's part of it. Someone where my dad worked. My dad has been having the kids draw some things. I think that's how he has this. Huh? Thing. 
think this was from where my dad was working last. All right. Thanks, Isaac. Yeah. All right. Did I turn it off? Yeah. So, um, there are a few different um, puzzles to play with, and there'll be opportunities for folks to uh, stay after the program and enjoy those, and uh, talk more to um, the designer and and, and, uh, and uh, folks behind that initiative. Um, so we have three panelists today, and they're folks who I met through the Ithaca Generator. Um, that's our common thread. And um, I'd like to welcome up uh, Claire Fox, um, who has pioneered uh, efforts at the physics bus and was a co-founder of Ithaca Generator and a, uh, a hero of youth education in Ithaca. Um, Xanthi Matichek from uh, Rev Startup Works here in Ithaca and also of Ithaca Generator and of course uh, Vic Apria, CTO of Wicked Device, um, an electronics manufacturer here in Tompkins County and co-founder, um, one, one of the co-founders of Ithaca Generator. So thanks for coming guys. Yeah. Um, so I guess I wanted to open up with just a few questions um, from, for the for the audience, really. Um, how many of you uh, have heard the term makerspace? You've heard it. Okay. How many of you have been to a place that called itself a makerspace? A few of you. Okay. Cool. Makerspace is actually a physical location. Um, it's, it, our makerspace is at 116 um, West Green Street. West Green, West Green Street. Street, and uh, it's in the back of the um, the alley, which is called Press Bay Alley, yeah. and it's down in the basement of the old Ithaca Journal Building. Um, a a, a makeathon. You also hear this called a hackathon sometimes, or uh, it tends to be a, a sort of an event rather than a place. Um, often they're held at makerspaces, but they don't need to be. And uh, makeathons tend to be sort of a weekend of getting together and building something. Mm -hmm. um, whereas a makerspace is sort of uh, a place you go for longer duration projects and to have more of a social community, I guess I would say, around what you're working on. But one thing you'll find, I think, about makerspaces is they all have their own personality. Um, some of them are really born of business, some of them are born of hobby, um, and the spectrum is all, the way, all in between all of that. I think our makerspace is much, um, much in the middle of that. There's certainly a, a number of members that um, had businesses, started businesses, um, continue to pursue business, but there's also a really strong educational component to uh, our roots, and there's also a really strong hobby component to our roots. Mm -hmm. The maker movement is something that everyone can do at their own level. A view of how things work and what, what is possible. Allowing people to create their future. It's an opportunity for us all to come together to learn new things. Creativity in the arts. Electronics, physics, computers. A place for people of all ages to learn more about science, to learn more about technology. Some of the greatest potential to uh, transform. People who love to create things just for the pleasure of creation. That's changing where we solve a problem. Instead of having a big company designing a product for us. And sort of being the only place to get certain things by, by giving ourselves the know-how. We can solve the problem where it happens. It will be a counterforce to the hyper-consumption that we have in this country. This power to go and make it yourself. You know, I think it really could change, you know, how we live. You're not just taking in what's out there and saying, you know, my identity is these things that I've watched and consumed. You're saying my identity is made up in part of these things that I've made. All of that stuff happens in a place like Ithaca Generator. Ithaca Generator is just an incredible resource for Ithaca. It's a nice place where you can get your work done in not too much noise. You can walk in knowing nothing, just having um, curiosity and a drive um, to do new things. Everyone likes it and it's a really nice place with many, many computers, machines. But you know, I was really impressed by the friendships that are established here. A place that sort of had open doors for anyone that shared this interest in making your own stuff. 
It's really more about the collaborative energy. You know, I spent weeks on a very simple problem to solve, and the idea of like turning around and asking someone to your left and having the answer immediately would have sent me miles ahead. We coordinate outreach um, with the local school systems, with, um, with public libraries, with community groups, so that we can reach as many children as possible. Children are particularly limited in their physical coordination. But their mind is already leaping ahead. They have these great ideas. A free printer that printed like in molecules and like, like a living animal. Like you could print a dog. A spaceship. A sprayer that would spray cement and it would just stay in the air and freeze. Kids learn really incredibly fast um, how to design things on a computer. The thrill that they experience the first time they connect a motor to a battery and they make their first electronic circuit, it's just amazing. Everyone wants this, um, but not everyone has access to it. So that's what is really important about a place like Ithaca Generator. The idea's kind of been around for a long time. I mean, humans have made stuff forever, but um, as as you know, as best we can sort of encapsulate it, uh, the makerspace movement that we have now started um, in like the early 2000s in Germany, um, and it was with three three spaces where basically groups of um, hardware hackers, folks who love to make things do other than they were intended for, uh, decided to get together and form a social uh, space where they could share resources and hang out and have fun together. And um, that movement, it, well, became sort of a movement. It was a new way of interacting. And that eventually spread to the States. Um, in 2005, um, Make Magazine popped up on the scene. And Make Magazine was a publication that was do-it-yourself, how-to, and that sort of became the focal point of hobbyists and inventors, and it created a cottage industry around kits and making. And they're still somewhat at the center of, of the, Make Magazine is the best known brand, but there are, is a wide spectrum of hobbyists around that. Um, Ithaca Generator was founded in 2012, so that was several years later. At that point, there were probably close to 1,500 maker spaces around the world. And um, it, it's, this scene had started to diversify. So as, as I understand it, I wasn't at Ithaca Generator when it was founded, but, um, but the values that were there um, probably reflected a wide range of interests, um, education, um, uh, community outreach, uh, sustainability, um, and actually, since we have two of our founders here today, Xanthi, were you on the, were you one of our founders too? No, okay, so okay, so, so we've got two founders. Maybe um, maybe Claire, you could talk a little bit about some of the values that that inspired you to help launch. I guess my interest got started the first time Mark handed me a Make magazine, and my mind is totally blown because um, my background is in art, but I like to incorporate electronics. I'm I'm working on becoming a scientist now, so it was this amazing you know nexus point between all of these things, and I said we have to make this happen. Um, and I have a young son, um, and he likes to invent and create as well. And I thought we just have to make this make this a reality. So we started to go around to our friends and people we knew and see who would be interested in, um, in being part of the board and founding this. So for me personally, uh, my focus was really on education. So I helped to coordinate programs for the first two years we were open. And we had um, programs for all different ages. Um, I focus on mostly on working through K through six. Um, so we have people from GIAC and uh, coming on a weekly basis uh, for, gosh, four years now. So, um, so yeah, my, my focus is really on, you know, working with kids and getting them started with this really broad and creative mindset early. What, uh, what are the core values of the maker, of a maker space or IG to you, which might be different for each person? Hmm. That's a good question. I think for me, like one really important thing is just mutual support. I think it's the most supportive learning environment I've ever been in. I mean, you can walk in knowing nothing about electronics or manufacturing, 
Uh, that was me, pretty much. <laughs> and there'll be people there who, you know, teach you how to weld. And, you know, you collaborate with them and, you know, you learn from that process. So for me, that's, that's really important, is the fact that everyone's coming together and teaching each other. It's very non-judgmental. Um, and everyone's there because they have sort of a lifelong love of learning. So I guess uh, another big motivation for the space was the ability to have a shared set of tools that you don't necessarily want to have in your garage. I mean, everyone would love to have a garage full of laser cutters and 3D printers, but uh, it's more economical and it's more um, accessible to kind of learn about how to use these kinds of tools in a community. Um, they can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. Having people that have sort of an insight into pitfalls and help helping each other through um, learning to use these technologies that are, uh, I think a major reason why the maker movement has kind of gained such momentum is because a lot of these manufacturing technologies have become a lot more accessible to um, a broader audience than they once were, right? Like the idea that you could, um, print an object from a 3D model in a day, um, it's like science fiction, but it's become fairly commonplace in, in the sphere of maker spaces. I think the general public still has a ways to go to um, kind of feel the commoditized effect of 3D printing, for example, but it's, it's remarkable that anyone can own one now, and um, maker spaces are kind of a gateway drug to learning about these things, I think. Ithaca Generator is a not-for-profit that's incorporated in Ithaca. Um, every town has the, like many towns have a, a maker space that's individually incorporated, and I'd say there are many larger towns that have many maker spaces in them. <laughs> so if you go to a place like New York City or so, you know, even Ithaca. Yeah. So yeah, so there are a couple of flavors of maker spaces. So um, you may be familiar with the brand Tech Shop, and that's a place that is much larger and much shinier than Ithaca Generator, and it's there for um, members who pay a pretty hefty fee, I mean hefty compared to us, mm -hmm. to really use those tools for um, low batch production and stuff like that. But the, if it seems schizophrenic that, you know, is it like, is it for kids or is it for business? It, I see this split all the time in different maker spaces and different maker communities, or it's not really a split. It's like this symbiotic thing. There's always this K through 12 kind of element because we're growing the next batch of artists and entrepreneurs, you know, whatever direction they, they go, and then there's this entrepreneurship element. I work in the hardware accelerator at Rev, and you know some of these inventors go on to commercialize their technology, and some of them don't. But it's all of a piece that you have the children and youth um, seeing themselves as making things that can change the world, whether it's a nonprofit invention or something that they commercialize and scale, and then having role models that, like Vic, you know, who, who owns an electronics company um, in Ithaca and creates jobs and, and does a lot of local manufacturing and design. Each makerspace is going to look different, too. Um, we're working to open a community science workshop, which will be pretty much just for kids. So you walk in and it's going to be covered in paint and sort of organized chaos. Um, but then you have, you know, much more professional spaces where, like Sandy said, you're going in, um, you know, to do manufacturing and production. And I think part of the beauty of it is that you can have many of these spaces in a good-sized town and that they can fit the needs of different people. Um, yeah. And there's also, I don't know how many, like at least a dozen small maker spaces at Cornell um, that are accessible for students and have different sets of tools. And I know that um, the Ithaca City School District is working on getting maker spaces into their elementary schools as well, and middle schools and high schools. Yeah. Yeah, there's also like a movement. Of, um, there's also, broadly speaking, there's a movement for maker spaces to become integrated into library systems as well. So I guess uh, so. There's uh, the, the three of you are in somewhat different, connected but different fields. So. Um, Maybe, maybe uh, you could each share like what, um, how the, how the makerspace, IG or another makerspace has influenced your personal projects in the community, um, and maybe because those may be different or they may have some similarities. How how has it empowered you or inspired you or whatever? Um, let's see. 
I met these two when they were forming the makerspace. I had never touched electronics before. I relo relocated here from Rochester where I was teaching industrial design, um, but hadn't done any electronics. And I met Claire and she invited me to a youth workshop in Ovid where students were putting together motors and batteries to make like fun little spinny things. Yeah. And that was actually a really empowering experience to be sitting among a bunch of eighth graders or <laughs> whatever age they were, like to make something move in that way that I've never done before. And, um, and that gave me the confidence to then like be at the makerspace more often and get into electronics. Um, I've worked on projects with Vic over the years, electronics projects, and now I'm, I have enough confidence and know-how. I'm, I'm far from an electrical engineer, but that I help run the hardware accelerator at Rev, where we get a crop of eight teams of inventors every year who are electrical engineers and mechanical engineers, and go from um, napkin idea to a full working prototype by the end of the summer. So. Um, yeah, it's, it was definitely where I am now. It's definitely an emergence of starting at the Makerspace three or four years ago. Okay. Well, for me, I am an electrical engineer. And uh, I, um, I guess I got into electrical engineering because at some point I made some circuits and I thought it was magical, right? And um, I wanted to know more. And I, I think the Makerspace gives me the opportunity to kind of unveil some of the mystery of it so that people um, can get that same feeling of magic and uh, get the get the bug to learn more. Um, it's also just a way to kind of like keep my inspiration for um, for technology up. Oh yeah, so my uh, my company is called Wicked Device, and we uh, my friend and business partner Dirk Swart, we started by making electronics in his attic, uh, and decided that these things we were doing were kind of possibly of general interest with the maker movement growing as it was for people to make kits, and so we started making kits for kids. Um, working with places like Make Magazine to uh, sell them. And in 2012, we uh, got involved in a project to monitor air quality and did a Kickstarter, uh, which is a crowdfunding campaign, to develop a product that could measure different pollutants in the air. And um, it went really well, and it's been sort of my uh, job for the last five years to kind of develop that technology, and we're still making them, so it's, it's great. Um, generator was sort of no small part of that in terms of uh, giving you know giving me a place to kind of bounce ideas off of people and um, learn what people like and don't like. So it's it's kind of a great resource to have a like-minded community to to talk to and learn from. We need to kind of do quick prototyping kind of work um, using the laser cutter, um, testing some small circuit that I want to make. It's it's uh, nice to have. Um, sort of a partial lab capability that's uh, part of the community. Yeah, and, I, and another thing is it's, um, it's actually a really great networking situation because you get um, all sorts of people that want to, you know, they have something that they've built and they think maybe it has legs. Um, it's hard, there's this big gap between I have a project that I made and I have a product that I want to sell. Mm -hmm. And um, being positioned where we are in Ithaca in a makerspace gives us the opportunity to serve um, that, that middle gap there where people um, want to kind of take a step without going all the way to full-scale production. They want to be able to make small batches. So we kind of help with that too. We do consulting work as well. Um, so right now I'm a PhD student, but in my spare time um, I work with the Ithaca Physics Bus. And I guess Ithaca Generator for me I met, uh, gave me an opportunity to sort of refine my ability to work with kids around STEM subjects and through talking to people like Xanthi, um, you know, I learned how to lead kids through sort of an inventive process. You know, you have an idea, you have a goal, you know, how are you going to get there? What happens when you fail? What happens when you fail repeatedly? You know, get yourself, you know, pick yourself up, you know, exercise that resilience muscle and, you know, observe it closely, figure out what's wrong with it. So being able to walk kids through that whole process of, you know, really creating something. And I think one thing that's missing, though, is that makerspaces haven't really made it into 
every town yet, and there's still kids, especially in rural areas, that aren't being reached. So um, with the physics bus, we work with local teenagers, um, mostly from LACS and GIAC, um, to build exhibits that then go around, they can go anywhere, and you know travel to these underserved populations. And we make all of our exhibits out of junk. So, you know, a big thing with maker spaces is sort of removing barriers and increasing access um, to technology and science and art. Um, so, when kids walk on the bus and see this, you know, they can see that it's just made out of, you know, an old computer speaker that someone is throwing out and a motor. And, you know, they get to. Uh, you know, go through the whole design process. So here we had a Fresno lens from an overhead projector that was being thrown out by the school systems because they don't use them anymore. And, you know, some kids worked on this challenge of, okay, well, it's really cool if you put it in front of your face, but how are we going to make it so that kids can, like, wear it? So we took, um, you know, an old, you know, recycling container, and <laughs> when you put it on your face like this, you always say, <laughs> oh boy. That's awesome. You know, you have an, ex an intuitive experience, so you're like, whoa. You know, even if you don't know the, you know, you don't use the word Fresno lens, kids start to get the idea that, you know, light can bend and images can be distorted. Um, and so kids had to go through this process and figure out, well, how can we attach this then? And oh, it's too small, and some people's heads are getting stuck. And what if you have a ponytail? <laughs> so they made a cut there. So you know, I'm really glad that I'm able to take the sort of skills that I learned there, and you know, work with these teens, and also you know, bring this sort of a DIY approach that you know, science and making is something everyone can do, being able to bring it to a larger audience. My name is Ben Finio and I am a postdoctoral researcher at Cornell University in the Creative Machines Lab run by Professor Hod Lipson. So that is the stuff that we're going to mix together to make the robot. Each one of those jars has liquid in it. You're going to mix it together and then we actually put the robot in the oven and that solidifies it. When I was a grad student at Harvard, I did a lot of guest speaking at um, science museums and schools and would kind of show videos of all these different robots that were being developed um, in our lab and other labs at Harvard. And kids always thought it was cool, but I would always get questions from parents and teachers asking, you know, is this uh, a project we can do at home or do you have some activity we can do based on this? And at, at the time, I always had to say no because I didn't have time to come up with the directions um, on the side. But now that I'm at Cornell, I'm actually working on middle school engineering education. So this was an opportunity to kind of take uh, a cool university level research project and turn it into a family activity. So, uh, squeeze through narrow constrictions. So that's just... I'm uh, Robert Shepard, an assistant professor at uh, Cornell. Um, my role here is actually just to support uh, Ben Finio, who's setting up a program for uh, K through 12 to build soft robots. <laughs> Was this tray from this table? Well, actually, this program, uh, the soft robotics program, was originally developed um, in the Whitesides group at Harvard. Um, it's just an idea that you can replicate soft machines using uh, 3D printed molds. And I was actually a, a postdoctoral researcher in that group. Um, and I sort of helped build that program and I'm um, continuing research in that area here now in the mechanical engineering program at Cornell. I made two already. I know, Taya, that's great. You got a little bit enough extra that you can make two. Um, so it was making air-powered soft robots. So we had the kids um, take 3D printed molds that we made in advance, and then they uh, mixed together a two-part silicone rubber. It's the same stuff they use to make props for movies and that kind of thing. Uh, pour that into the molds, and then literally stick it in an oven to bake it to solidify the rubber that was initially liquid. 
and then once the robot is made, you um, stick an air tube into it and hook up a little um, squeeze bulb that you use to kind of clean off uh, lenses and camera equipment and that kind of thing. That supplies um, compressed air that inflates the robot, and depending on the shape of the mold, um, that then creates a robot that can either grip things or walk along the surface of a table, ideally. We're gonna, so depending on which mold you have, some of them are this kind and some of them were the one that picked up the chicken egg. They're made of nonlinear materials, so they're actually very hard to predict how they're going to move. Uh, so the, our understanding of their control systems is pretty um, limited right now. Um, but once we have made them, uh, we can't, uh, the repeated, mo the motion is very repeatable. So once we've made them, we know how to use them, but understanding how to control them before we've made them is actually fairly difficult. We had some surprisingly good results, not as well as the ones made in the lab. You know, you have to keep in mind that the, um, the ones made in the lab that we show videos of are made by people with engineering degrees who kind of have time to perfect the process. And for every cool YouTube video you see of a working robot, there were probably 10 that didn't work. So given the age group of the children here, you know, we had a lot of elementary and middle school kids. I, I was really pleasantly surprised with how well it turned out. I think we had some that um, had some holes and air leaks that needed to be patched up, but uh, a lot that actually worked pretty well on the first try. There's a lot of evidence that shows that a lot of kids kind of lose interest in science and engineering by around middle school age because you know you're gonna, you go home and do your math homework and you learn you know first multiplication and then pre-algebra you know whatever math you're doing at that age but they don't see the connection to cool stuff like robots um, and during the school day if you don't get to do an activity like this you know eventually that leads to a lot of kids thinking well science is boring math is boring I would never use this you know what's it for so I think Activities like this are really important because it gives kids something where at the end, you know, they have a physical product that they can hold and go, you know, wow, that's awesome, I made something. Where do you see the, the next, say, five years of makerdom in Ithaca? I mean, you've got a few projects. Each of you has taken these spin-offs from Ithaca Generator now, and Ithaca Generator is still here. Um, where would, you, where would you love to see it could be in, in say, five years? Can you, play, you can start, because I bet you got some good ideas. <laughs> um, oh, gosh. I think every neighborhood needs a maker space. I think part of, um, part, of, part of what makes people feel comfortable in a space is if they walk in and they see people that are similar to them, you know, working on things that, you know, sort of would meet their needs, too. Mm -hmm. and. Not everyone necessarily feels that when they walk into the generator, and that's something that we've struggled with and we've addressed in some ways. But you know, if you were to just open a maker space in each of these neighborhoods, then each one is going to have its own flavor, and each one is going to meet the needs of that particular group of people. Um, so I'm really excited to be opening up a community science workshop. Um, you know, we're going to target a low-income neighborhood. Uh, the kids can walk out anytime and visit it. So I think. For us, being able to create a space where you know kids can walk in and and work on whatever they want to—that's that's my personal goal. But I think there just need to be more of them. I think a generator mostly serves its members, and you know that's our primary purpose at this point. So we do offer some educational programs, but um, the maker movement is huge, and um, and I think there's a great deal of like broad public awareness within educators. Um, that the maker movement exists, and there's a lot of resources out there for if you want to start a maker space in your school. So I've definitely had conversations with some administrators who were curious and they wanted to hear my opinion about you know how to get it set up, but they're mostly pursuing you know their own path. So I uh, again work in the hardware accelerator at Rev, and we are coming on our third summer of taking eight teams from napkin idea to uh, prototype, and just as the maker movement has opened up product development to more people, um, I really want to see a more diverse crowd seeing themselves as inventors and applying to the hardware accelerator. So um, that's, that's my hopeful vision. I think the bulk 
um, of the applicants we get are from Cornell, and then um, it's our goal to kind of counter brain drain, to get them to come here and start companies and create jobs, and, and that's been happening at Revit Large, which is pretty exciting. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm in agreement with both of uh, the other panelists. I, I think we have a ways to go for diversity. Um, and uh, outside of that, I think there's a lot of opportunity for generator to grow physically. The space that we have is relatively small. Um, and having more space hopefully could facilitate things like um, having a bigger educational program and having um, more inclusivity uh, that's enabled by that. Uh, and also having more and better tools that are um, accessible to uh, the community of makers and um, generally generally just having kind of more technology in Ithaca, I think that has like a lot of feedback effects that'll make, uh, you know, this could be the Silicon Valley of the East Coast. I mean, it doesn't have to be in New York City, right? It could be in the Southern Tier. So I used to teach industrial design and we would, talk about um, you know products that are out there and my students would say oh yeah they designers do this and designers do that and there's this even as des industrial design students they had this real problem seeing themselves and having the agency is like I'm eventually going to go out and make things that are in the world so that kind of cultural shift that um, that only the hands-on kind of experiences I think that you have in maker spaces and, and other places like that um, is, is really important, it's a barrier, and then it's definitely something that we target to flip. Um, we haven't said the word science, technology, education, and math yet, and that's uh, sort of an integral part of the maker movement. Um, I mean, at the, I don't want to politicize the question, but you know, like science and math in American schools has sort of been struggling and not excelling worldwide for a while. I think um, maker spaces and Ithaca Generator kind of serve a need to bolster that education of our youth in that area. So the school system in general, I think, is, is, is a little barrier. Thank you for saying that, because <laughs> I didn't want to be negative. But I think I'm just, I'm really thankful to, to that the public school system is recognizing the importance of you know, the types of experiences that um, making can bring. So, you know, I think there's also different types of STEM education. So I think what Grant is saying is, yeah, people are not self-identifying as having these skills. They see them as intimidating. You know, you think of, you know, if you ask someone to draw an inventor or a scientist, they usually draw, like, you know, a middle-aged white guy. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe he has a lab coat. Maybe something's exploding behind him. You know, so there are all these sort of mental conceptions of who can invent and who can make and who can be a scientist. And so I think getting people in that are different, that are that are female, that are from different cultures, that are from different races, like getting them in early as role models and also getting the kids, um, you know, working through these processes early and learning that they can invent and they can work through problems when they come up. And yeah, so just starting really young and, you know, doing it the right way, not in a cookie cutter way where everyone is sitting down to learn exactly the same fact or make exactly the same thing. Yeah, that's it. Actually, if I could add. I think um, even in the best educational programs, you don't get as much hands-on, like, practical application of what you're learning as you could possibly get um, by being involved in uh, in a lab environment, right? Like, uh, I think I think of, I have a mental mental model of uh, the makerspace as a lab environment. It's a place to kind of explore and invent. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's kind of... Thanks. So I'm glad you brought up STEM because I'm um, on a project I'm working with him becoming an expert in the next-gen science standards that New York State just adopted. And, it, and I don't know if this will take in five years or not, but it seems like they're really trying to make a connection between science as a place to, as a way to understand the world and to identify and really understand problems in the world very deeply and engineering, that it doesn't just end with identifying problems, but that we can use our creativity and our hands-on problem solving to um, create solutions to the problems that we identify with science. I mean, even in like really simple terms, I, I, I think in my lifetime I've seen these topics um, like science and technology and math kind of go from like being portrayed as outside to being more mainstream and I think that's very exciting. 
So uh, you mentioned st uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And I've also heard the word STEAM used, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Um, why are there two terms? And is there a third one? Steamed? Oh, OK. Do, um, do you want to uh, explore the difference there? Like, what, what's, the, what's the revolution? Of what's the, what are these A's and D's about? The most value in adding art and design to STEM is that more people can identify to it. So some students may not see themselves as scientists or engineers, but if there's a, is art can be an entryway into engaging with that type of work, then, then I'm all for it. Plus, I just in my heart, I love the integration of art and science, and there are some incredible projects out there, but, um, but the more practical value is just yeah. having it be more accessible to more people. I think it's a recognition that making great things involves more than just building something functional. It's got to be more than that. It's got to reach people at a human level, and it's got to be thought through so that, um, so that it creates a good experience, not just a good product. Physically. A few folks here, m many folks in the audience said they've been to a makerspace before. Um, I noticed you're not members of ours yet, but that's okay. We'll convert you. Um, what, and, and really, so it, we were talking about IG, we're talking about REV, a physics bus, potentially uh, the community science workshop. What's the, what should people expect when they walk in the door? If someone's interested in this and they find the address and they show up. What's the, what should they expect? What's the next step? Does that make sense? Like what, what's it, yeah, well I mean what's the, what's the point of entry, right? If, 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 if I am excited about this, should I, do I bring something with me? Do I, do I have to be a student or do I have to be, do I have to have a painting already? My experience in going from zero to maker, or whatever the expression is, is that, um, I don't know, I've found that I get a little bit more engagement with a new community if I've done some homework first, to be quite honest. Um, walking in just like, I'm really interested in this. Sometimes the community will uh, engage you, but sometimes it's like you need to, you actually need to go home and do a little bit of homework on something. Yeah. I don't know if that's bad or good, but that's just been my experience. Well, I know, I know at IG uh, there are, are regular nights that happen. So if there's a specific interest mm -hmm. that you have, um, 3D printing still on Tuesdays. Uh, I think. Thursdays now. Thursdays is yeah. Um oh. And there's like monthly meetups that we have as well. Uh, there's an electronics meetup once a month. There's um, there's a science fiction book club. You know, there's all sorts of angles to how you can get involved in the community. Learning about that community, again, like Santi said, is an important part. We have a website. Yeah, ithicagenerator.org. Uh, ithicagenerator.org. Um, I can, I mean, that's probably a good place to, to land. And then showing up is half the battle, honestly. Like, if, once you get there, people usually will uh, <coughs> be interested that there's a new face there and hopefully they'll engage you. Um, but you know, there's a social, social interactions are always hard. Well, it's a community of technologists. So <laughs> you really have to be just um, very open-minded about that and, and do know that it's, that it's hard. You know, a lot of these technologists were working in their garages alone for years and years and years. And all of a sudden maker spaces emerged and, um, and they're trying to be social. <laughs> so yeah, just some awareness around that. Like I come from a family of engineers, so I totally get it, but um, there's a mix of reactions. I think for me, I came in with projects and you can, like for me, a lot of what I did was just sending an email out on the, on the group list saying, you know, I really want to make an LED matrix. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who's going to work on it with me? And then you pick a date and everyone figures out, you know, how they can contribute. And so I did a lot of projects in the beginning that were just like, I've always wanted to make this thing. Who's going to, who's in? Um, and that was a good way for me to meet people and learn new skills. So I made these prescription glasses with about $25 and two hours of work. First, I needed some acrylic to make the frames. Obviously, I needed the lens. I needed some small finishing nails, some super glue, and of course, the laser.
So design out your frames and then design out the shape of your lens. You're gonna make sure to use the same holes so when it's all cut out, they line up perfectly. 1.2 millimeter will match the finishing nails. Cut out your frames on the laser. So you heat it up with a heat gun so you can bend it the way you want to. You use the leather as a heat insulator for the acrylic that you don't want to bend. And then you tighten it up right where you want it to bend. So you just use a scrap piece of metal as a heat shield so you don't heat parts of the acrylic that you don't want to bend. You use the same scrap piece of metal to bend it over so you don't melt your hands. And you hold it into place. When you get it in the right place, you can cool it down. It'll stay. And then when you pull it out, it's heat set. Put your frames on and take a picture of your face. You'll need to get the spacing between your pupils for the lens. Mine are 60 millimeter. Uh, be sure to start cut the lens where your pupils are in the middle. Laser cut the lenses. Push a nail through the holes for the lenses. I like the nails facing forward, but most people would like to face them back and grind off the tips. When you get the lenses where you want, just dab a super glue and hold the lenses in place on the frames. All this equipment was free because I'm a member of Ithaca Generator. I hope you like my project to make a pair of $25 glasses, and now I can rock, walk around with some sporty, clear unibrow. Do not forget to hydrate, stay in school, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, do not loan Casey Griswold any money. That's all I got. So again, we've mentioned that's the IG, we've mentioned uh, Rev and Physics Plus and Houston. What other, um, the title of this program is that we are a community of makers, right? So um, I know that there are, there's a proliferation of, of avenues available for people. And I wonder if you guys, if you guys want to shout out any that we haven't touched on yet or. Um, I just read the board minutes from your meeting the other night and I was excited to see that Olive Branch Press reached out to yeah. you for a collaboration. They're a local print shop above CSMA. It's just a gorgeous print shop. Um, we've got So Green. We have such a rich tradition of woodworking and American craft in this region that you can see a lot of it at Handwork, um, the store on the other side of the commons. It's a cooperative. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vic can probably speak more to manufacturing, but I just, I love all that beautiful artisan work. And then you see s some uh, fusion of that too, like, you know, taking more traditional woodworking and mixing it with lasers. I know Lauren Hammond, who is a local woodworker, does that too. Um, yeah, there, uh, there's, there's a number of, of avenues, I guess, like you mentioned many of them. Um, let's see, like, I don't know if you know the Wizarding Weekend that happens in Ithaca. Ithaca Generator had something to do with that. Lawrence is a board member, Lawrence um, Clark Burke, and he actually runs a community bike workshop as well that's uh, periodically run at, at Generator. And has a store. And he has a store right there in the alley. I mean, yeah, actually, every, every Wednesday night now is Bike Club. So yeah, we took over the back half, so we've got a 400 square foot bike workshop now just this year. That's, that's yeah. a brand new space to us, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. But but there's definitely I mean there's definitely options right I mean it's we happen to represent Ithaca Generator um, here today we we all love it and that's what we you know but mm -hmm. um, but uh, we are like I feel like Ithaca is just so like tremendously um, well endowed with these spaces and avenues for creativity um, but sometimes like I know when I moved here it was hard it took me a year to just decide that I could go and show up somewhere and just mm -hmm. start participating so. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Ithaca Generator was the right place for me, but um, there are there are many other options as well. So that's kind of important. Wow. The uh, Ithaca Generator um, runs it runs a little bit like a health club, wherein you you could show up during our open hours. We're open uh, during the week from seven until everyone leaves, which is usually between ten and midnight. Mm -hmm. In the evening, right, not a.m., at p.m., right, 7 p.m. till when people leave. Um, and there's various themes, from game night to 3D printing, electronics, bikes. That's all on our website. And on the weekends, we're open from 10 to 2. 
and uh, at a minimum. And those, uh, those are usually more project time for our members, so people will just socialize and build stuff. Uh, our membership works, it's a bit like a health club, like I said, so for a monthly rate, anywhere from 20 to $75 a month, um, a member will gain access to our facilities. And depending on the level of membership, if that might be uh, electronics and generally non-lethal equipment, um, in the in the front area, uh, you know, we have sewing machines and uh, 3D printers and a laser cutter and uh, computer design software on them and, uh, and so on and so forth. And then uh, for uh, $35, you get access to a wood shop with a table saw and a compound miter saw and, a, and so on and so forth. And a welding, we have some welding equipment there as well. Um, and then for power users, uh, you can get 24-hour access with your own key. Um, you, have to, you know, there's a little bit of getting to know you involved in that before we uh, just give you a key. But for se but for $75 a month, you can sort of get access and use it as use it at your convenience. Um, so Ithaca Generator is probably one of the least formal of, of all the things we've talked about. I think IG is probably the least. Um, Formal, right? I mean, any anybody can walk in. And, uh, you have to be 14 to be a member, and if you're not 17, you need your parents to be there with you. Um, but we don't uh, require that you're a student or um, or have any particular background. Uh, we don't require that you have a business plan or um, anything like that. So um, we try to do public events when we can. Um, a lot of times, the energy that that we have for outward facing activities goes into things like Wizarding Weekend um, or events like this. Uh, we are, during those hours, we're open to the public. So if you were to stop by between seven and nine, you could see what folks were working on that day. Um, a few times a year, we might do a public facing event in the alley. Um, and those are generally on our calendar or posted, but yeah. I came in because I was, a, I was a, like an amateur woodworker and I, the saws in the basement were not, the landlord didn't like that. So um, so I found the generator so I could just build, you know, my little birdhouses and shelves and stuff like that. Um, our members, geez, well, uh, Lee launched Ithaca Toys uh, this year, um, and those are selling um, around the country. We have folks who do everything from Etsy stores, laser cut uh, products, to um, electronics prototyping, um, small projects, a pure art. We had members that did um, public grant funded art exhibits, uh, light shows and things um, in town. Mark did that really cool uh, motion sensitive light show. Um, we've received various uh, artist grants um, for, and one, right now we're producing um, Ithaca's first kinetic sculpture derby. So that's an outward facing event in the uh, Ithaca Fest parade this year. Um, you uh, can all expect to see a, hopefully a large mob, but a mob nonetheless of kinetic sculptures that we've uh, helped folks make uh, to move through the parade for awards and prizes uh, in the name of good fun. So, um, am I leaving out any major topics? What have you guys made at Ithaca Generator? What haven't you made at Ithaca Generator? <laughs> What am I talking about? I thought you were going to talk about Casper. He asked about Oh, yeah. Yeah, what do, what do members make? We definitely have, you know, a crew of kids that generally come in with their parents and have their own ideas. <laughs> and, you know, they, you know, sometimes they have, like, a really well, you know, clearly formed idea that they want to turn into a product. Um, my own son likes to rummage around in the, um, you know, in the scrap bin. And you know the kind of process will happen is he'll like pull out a piece of, you know, tinted acrylic, and he'll see that it's kind of the shape of sunglasses, and then he'll have to figure out how to attach it to his head, and then he'll think about how in Ithaca we don't have any sunlight except today, <laughs> and so he'll like attach an LED and think about, you know, whether or not this is something that he could actually turn into a product, or whether he's going to fry people's eyeballs, and <laughs> so we do definitely have this group of you know, kids that show up, you know, you walk in and they're always working on something. Um, and then in my education work, I think kids love anything that, that moves, any kind of electronics project that has a motor, you know, that can be a little car or, um, you know, like a little propeller. So a lot of what we do are just, you know, really quick, fast, you know, electronics projects where they have to, you know, work through some engineering challenge with it. 
Who asked this question? Did you? Oh. Um, I'm really interested in the intersection of craft and technology. So the stuff that I work on is like, I'll do a rough 3D model and then, you know, in software, and then pull the geometry from that literally by like just writing it down and then hand draw something based on that geometry and make it by hand or cut something on the laser, but kind of this going back and forth between um, more hands-on craft and high-tech stuff. And then I, I've been spending a lot of time capturing the process of making, especially working in the hardware accelerator. Like how do you, what are the steps that you need to go through to go from an idea to something that you can put in front of customers or in front of users and, and leave with them for a week. So that's a lot of my creative energy is going towards that these days. Well, right now you're making something pretty, pretty tangible, right? Can you talk about that? The, the tweetable light? Yeah. What? I mean, are you are you allowed to? Yeah. <laughs> well, in the in Elliot's in the kinetic sculpture derby, um, I'm working with some women on making a, a a little light pin, or I'm not sure what the form will be yet, but that you can tweet at with a board that's called uh, particle electron. Um, I guess I'd want to go back to something that I, we kind of skimmed over. Uh, Ithaca Generator isn't, it's a, it's a company insofar as it's a um, incorporated not-for-profit. It's actually a 501c3 charity as well, just, just to uh, fill that a little bit. But it's all run democratically, like everyone that comes there and keeps the space open is just a member that's a volunteering their time to do that. Yeah. There's no staff. Um, there's no staff, so um, that's, really, that's really great in, in a lot of ways. Um, I think that's a place where maybe there's some place that we can grow as well, right? Maybe there is a place where having staff yeah. uh, staff times that give more open hours and things like that could be be helpful. Mm, yeah. I mean, because there's no, um, there isn't a, uh, a a development company or uh, you know a facilities manager, mm -hmm. so um, it's projects organized by members that build up a new bike club, right. you know, or um, decide that we want uh, to have more robust sovereign equipment or improve our storage solutions or um, improve the lighting. Yeah. So a certain amount of energy goes right back into just deciding how it is that we want to work together and, and um, building, building our community. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the greatest projects that I've worked on when we were, while we were there is just turning the basement of the uh, I think a journal building into a place that's habitable, right? Like we actually built walls in there and um, built a, like a lighting rig up, and so it's all, uh, yeah, it's all, it's kind of all open, open to people like you and me to make it what we want it to be. Yeah, I mean, there's there are at least some members who choose to be members because they support our mission. You know, I, there, certain, there certainly are some folks, you know, who, who join the way you might become a member of NPR, right? They say, you know, this is a, this is an organization. It's doing something important. No one else is doing it. I'd like to be a member so that I can support what you're doing. Um, that's not a large portion of our membership. Uh, I'd say most of our members come in at least once a month and work on something. Um, and some of them come in. I mean, we have some folks who are there almost every day. Um, so the range. Our our lowest level of membership is $20 a month, which we set because we think it's pretty affordable, but we do have scholarships available, I believe. Mm -hmm, we do. Um, and that's just writing info at ithacagenerator.org. Um, I don't, you, you two would know more about if there was some initial money raised, but what's, what is also impressive about Ithaca Generator, there's no staff, there's also, it's completely member funded. Um, we bought one piece of equipment with a crowdfunding campaign, but it's, you know, we're a, we're a nonprofit and people think, oh, well, you have, um, you know, government funding and we don't. So funding is a challenge, especially for people in the arts. A trick that I um, use sometimes is to tie whatever I'm doing to technology or science. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be too far of a leap to say metal smithing is going to teach students um, skills in welding or in manufacturing or something like that. And if you frame it that way, you know, like again, as we were saying with art, right? Mm -hmm. So that's an entry. You know, they're making jewelry, but then all of a sudden they have these mm -hmm. these other uh, skills that are more were valued by funding agents. Yeah. Do you want to talk about how you started? Oh. Like, 
bootstrapping. <laughs> oh yeah, we're totally bootstrapped. <laughs> and I, you know, I just want to celebrate the fact that we have been, that you know, how much we have done, yeah. you know, just member supported. I mean, that's really our story yeah. and crowdsourcing. So we don't have any major grants. We haven't ever gotten major grants. We've gotten a few sort of project specific grants to work on things we wanted to make. We haven't, and you know, part of that is that we don't have a staff. We don't have like a grant writer on staff. But there is enormous funding potential out there. Um, there's you know, lots of money for STEM work and education and you know entrepreneurship. So the money's out there. But um, I think our story is that you know we've been able to make everything happen just through the support of our members. So like the welding equipment was donated and. You know, we had a really successful fundraising campaign for our laser cutter, which is operating pretty much constantly. Um, yeah. It's about it's a lot about critical mass. You know, you, you I think a generator was the second attempt at a makerspace we mentioned earlier. Uh, before before that, uh, I had been part of another uh, group that was trying to get one going, but it kind of fizzled out because of. Um, just not enough people. So it took us about eight months to of meetings sort of in people's living rooms to um, kind of build up enough initial capital. Just we, we all just agreed we'll spend, we'll put, every time we come to the, one of these meetings, we'll put in a little bit of money until we have a pot that lets us kind of pay the first month of mortgage on a space. And we went shopping for a space and we found one. Um, but once you actually have broken through that critical mass, the inertia of it is kind of uh, amazing that it can keep it going. How, and we touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to kind of expand it a little bit. How do you see maker movement specifically um, fortifying Tom, the Tompkins County uh, economy and manufacturing industry? Like, do you see avenues where it is um, helping us not just make more hobby crafts, but building, a, building an ecosystem? And could you maybe talk, talk a little bit about how that works? I mean, just just getting people, um, getting awareness of people that have skills in the community, so that you can, as a business owner, like knowing people is um, hiring someone that you know is much easier than hiring someone that you don't. Generally speaking, um, you get to know them beforehand. You get to uh, kind of get a feel for how they would interact in a so social environment. If you actually work on projects with people, you find out how they work under pressure sometimes too. And uh, all that's important for kind of team building. Um, so like, just getting a pool of technology, uh, pe people that are good at technology to, you know, you can like, think of spinning off companies out of Generator from working on a project together there. That kind of um, building up an ecosystem yeah. through that is a great uh, possibility. Do you have anything else that you could I feel like say? I covered it yeah. before. I mean, I could say it again, but like there's this youth component mm -hmm. that yeah. getting children early and really seeing themselves as people that understand the world of science and can solve problems for engineering. Yeah. And, um, and then growing up and, and making the world better with this knowledge, whether that's through nonprofit channels or starting a company here in Ithaca, uh, and also a lot of the scientific research that's going on at the universities um, yeah. staying here. I think there's another angle to it, which is that um, the there there's a possibility of kind of um, making vocational study more of a central thing in our society, getting more kind of skilled labor mm -hmm. into into the yeah. population. There are fairs that happen across the country called Maker Fairs, which is another element of the Maker Movement. Um, there are events that happen two or three times a year in large capacity, but like every month throughout from May to November, oh, basically there's oh, some place in the country that's having one. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had one in Ithaca yet, but I think there's one happening in the Southern Tier. Uh, this yeah, there's one in uh, Horsehead, Southern Tier, uh, Mini Maker Fair yeah. uh, well, in Horseheads. Yeah, so what, one of the amazing things about these fairs is you go there and you see these young people that are doing amazing things. Like, incredible. 
I think lasers and 3D printers yeah. get a lot of attention mm -hmm. because they look yeah. weird. They, they look like the products that we buy in stores. But actually, I think one of the more magical and interesting things about the maker movement mm -hmm. is this Arduino platform that allows you to make electronics that do things. Yeah. And, and that extends into this class of products called the Internet of Things that are web-connected electronics. And a lot of times people see that and they say, oh, my kids play with that. But really, like, that's the stuff that's in all of your gadgets. And to start to see yourself as someone who can make uh, inventions with that and tinker with that stuff, that's one of the brains that's on the inside of a lot of products you see in stores. Mm -hmm. And we started by visiting other maker spaces. The first one was Crash Space in LA, where my son, who was six years old, learned how to remove handcuffs. <laughs> um, and yeah, and we visited a couple of spaces that were closer by. And definitely, when when there are other, there have been other a lot of other maker spaces, like at least three or four that I can think of that when they've wanted to get started, they've sent members here to sort of see how we're yeah. structured, see how we're set up, you know, ask us for advice, you know, what do we want to avoid, you know, how did you make this happen? So yeah, there's definitely a lot of um, cro cross termination. Yeah, yeah. And then in the Obama administration, um, the Office of Science and Technology Policy was pulling um, people from maker spaces all over the country to convene in Washington, and Elliot and I both got to participate in those meetings. And one of the biggest takeaways um, I got from that was that you know there's this temptation to say let's have one central maker space in every city and that's the most efficient thing to do but the most effective thing to do it turns out is to have a lot of little spaces around the city what Claire was talking about having ownership and then having mobile spaces that can get hard to reach people and that having this having lots of different ways for people to interact is more effective even though it doesn't look so efficient. The meetings as Anthony talked about um, actually grew into a um, a fully fledged 501c3 that spun off of those meetings this year. Uh, the Nation of Makers is a um, a, a, a national scale organization that was incorporated in the last just the last three to four months and um, is a framework where hundreds or maybe thousands of maker spaces have decided to, to, to hitch their wagons together and share um, information and resources. Um, and for the most part, we're all still our own organizations, but there's a network there. And as an example, um, so I'm the, I'm the president of the board now, but I didn't really have any experience in that role when I got, um, when the, when the um, membership elected me in October. Um, but uh, shortly after that was a maker fair in Rochester. And so when I went up there, I realized that I was standing in a circle with the, um, you know, the executive director of the Salt Makerspace in Syracuse and the president of uh, the Rochester Makerspace and the president of uh, Triple Cities Makerspace in Binghamton and um, another guy who was working on starting up a makerspace in Elmira and was looking for advice. And so um, you know, out of that, we all exchanged notes and I ended up with all these documents and financials and this is what worked for us and this is how we do our classes. So it's definitely active right now and maybe more so than than ever has been, I don't know. But but um, it's it's growing and the network is definitely growing. So and this and what we're doing today is part of it, right? It's it's getting out there and um, can I hear Yeah, I don't know if you mentioned you did mention the word hacker, so I feel like when we got started, it was really before it blew up into a big educational thing. Um, and so I think our space has a little more of the flavor of a traditional hacker space, so sort of the first generation. A lot of what happened to make the movement go more mainstream was this transition from the language that was being used, you know, the, the word hacker. In, in my view, the word hacker is not a bad word, and I think it's. I think it's. Uh, there's a lot of great historic figures that I consider to be hackers, but um, <laughs> yeah, you know, there's there's a book called Hackers by uh, Stephen Levy, actually, and it documents sort of the computer generation, um, how computers went from being things in universities to being in your living room, and uh, you know, they they were heroes to me, those kinds of people. Um, I don't think calling us ourselves makers changes the fact that we share the same ideals as those people. Um, and yeah, like you said, I think it's a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of, the chaos of it is actually a little bit of uh, 
great things come out of chaos. Right? So you don't necessarily want to normalize everything. Right. <laughs> to, to answer your question, though, we are open to large grants. Yeah, if you have <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Even small grants. Even small grants. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks, audience. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.